morning. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Our lives consist of our relationships, and the quality of our lives is based on the quality of our relationships. Some of our relationships are good and can grow stronger. Some of our relationships are damaged and can heal. We turn to God for guidance. We seek to serve others as Jesus served the world. We eagerly anticipate the birth of Christ and the rebirth of Christ in our lives so that we may have a fuller experience of his gift of love. Our scripture is from Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. This morning, we light two purple Advent candles from the previous weeks, the candles of hope and peace. We also light the pink candle of joy. Today's purple candle symbolizes God's promise of love given to us through Jesus Christ. We seek Jesus to inspire us to new levels of service so that we may give love to and receive love from each other better. Let us pray. Dear God, you are love. I am created in your image. Restore me to your likeness. Fill my life with patience. Fill my life with kindness. Move me from selfishness to service. May I be more loving day to day. May I love people like you love people. May I continually move people closer to you. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Chad Shookman. I'm the youth pastor here at the Water's Edge, and um, I think that, that I have to preface that because it, it falls under the whole idea of, uh, I think white elephant stuff uh, definitely fits in my category here. See, I love white elephant parties. Anybody been to a white elephant Christmas party? Um, uh, I've been a part of them. I've been a part of them with my friends. I've been a part of them with um, the, my family and, and my coworkers. And, and, and often, a lot of times when we do them, you give some direction and you say, you know, like, we're going to do an ornament exchange, right? You, you do an ornament exchange. Somebody always brings the green pickle. Um, you do gift cards, uh, $10 gift cards. And um, I'm always the one that ends up with something to like Bed Bath & Beyond or something like that. Um, or or the, the most fun ones, though, are, are the ones where you just say, you can bring anything you want, but you can't spend more than $10 or you can't spend money at all. And then people have to get really creative. And, and those are the, the ones that we always used to do with our youth group. Um, when I was, when I was uh, first starting in ministry. And one of my favorite gifts of all came a few years ago at one of our youth, minister, at our youth Christmas party. party. One of the volunteers that we had, he worked for a company, and they assembled, delivered, and then installed and, and set up uh, exercise equipment in people's homes. So he spent the whole year putting together treadmills and bicycles and all those kinds of things. And, and how many of you have had to do that yourself? You've had to put something together in your home. What do, what do you get every single time you buy something and you have to open it and put it together? Okay, instructions are good, but you get like five new Allen wrenches, right? And every single, for, for a whole year, every single piece of, 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 of equipment that he put together, of exercise equipment that he put together, he took all of those Allen wrenches and he put them in a plastic gallon bucket. And then he wrapped it and he brought it to our Christmas party as a white elephant gift. Now, there's two things that stick out to me about that. And, and the first is, never in my life have I seen somebody so excited to watch somebody else open a present that they brought. 
And the second part of that is never in my life have I seen somebody's face go to a, from excitement to uh, when they realized the present that they had just opened was a gallon ice cream bucket full of Allen wrenches. You see, for the giver of the gift, that present was something that he had spent an entire year working towards, right? In one sense, that represented hundreds of hours of his time. It was a gift that he'd been contemplating and planning and waiting to give for an entire year. And every single time he, was, he put together a treadmill, he thought, white elephant gift, white elephant gift, white elephant gift. He was so excited for that. But for the receiver of the gift, they had 15 pounds worth of Allen wrenches that they now had to carry around. And in fact, to be honest, like that was an inconvenience for them. She wasn't sure what to do with it. She didn't even want it. She had no use for it. And I'm honestly not even sure that she left the church with it. In fact, I'm probably sure that that bucket is still sitting in a cabinet in the youth room somewhere at Faith Westwood. White elephant gifts are kind of like that, right? The giver spends lots of time working on the gift. They think about it. They, either, uh, they are either trying to make somebody really happy or they're trying to get a really good laugh out of it. And, and, and they, as they do that, they anticipate and they're so excited about what they're going to do. And then the receiver of it, for the white elephant gift, the, the receiver of that gift, it can be awkward sometimes, confusing what am I going to use a $10 gift card at, for me at Bed Bath & Beyond for? Why didn't I get the Best Buy gift card? Or, or how come I didn't get all that, the, the Scooters gift card, right? That's what I would use. And, and it seems, so our gifts can feel sometimes inconvenient or awkward or useless. And, and so a lot of times we get these white elephant gifts and either we don't think we need them or we don't know what to do with them or we don't want them or we just don't want to have to deal with them. Sometimes, though, a white elephant gift, it ends up being just the thing we needed, even if we don't understand it. As we've traveled through Advent together, we've looked at how the gifts of hope and peace and joy often come in packages that we weren't expecting, that we didn't know that we needed, that we weren't sure how we might use them. Along the way, we've discovered through the stories that that Craig and, and Leandra and, and even Michelle have told at some of our special services that that. And, and the experiences that we've had through those of, that we've seen in God's story, we can experience hope through healing, we can experience peace through acceptance, and we can experience joy through our humility. And this week, we turn to love. And, and like a white elephant gift, we find love maybe this year in one of the more unexpected, underplayed, and undervalued characters and stories within the Christmas story. In Matthew chapter 1, it says, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child that is within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And it says, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, where it said, look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, it says, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. I think when we read Matthew's accounts, uh, and, we, and we look at this, this, is a, this story is actually about what happened between God and Joseph. And I think we learned some really cool things about Joseph. Is the first thing we learned is that Joseph, he tried to do the right thing in, in a really bad circumstance. He's engaged to be married, and he finds out that his betrothed, the person that his, his, his fiancée is pregnant. 
And he could have done this in so many different ways. He could have, he could have br brought her publicly and shamed her and done all kinds of other things. That he had worked hard in his life to, to build a business and to secure a, a, a good standing in society. And so now he's excited to be married, and, and now things are just falling apart. And he could have. He could have done it in, in, in a horrible way. He could have embarrassed her. He could have, he could have shamed her. And he could have come off, I, I didn't do this, this isn't me, somebody else, something bad happened, and I'm out. But he didn't. It says he, he was going to divorce her quietly. He, he, he tried to do the right thing for everybody involved. He didn't want her to have this shame and carry it around, and, and, and he was willing to go about it in a different way that, that helped everybody kind of save face in the situation. Secondly, he obeyed God's commands. Things took another turn, right? He's, he's got these plans. That he's going he's gonna to divorce her quietly. And then an angel of the Lord comes and visits him in a dream and, and it tells him, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. All of this is in God's plan and everything is going to turn out okay. And so what does he do? He actually obeys that commandment. In fact, in doing so, he set himself up for ridicule and shame. But he obeyed God's commandment and took Mary as his wife. And then over and over again, we see that he sacrificed for his family. Joseph protected them. When the wise men, it says, had gone in Matthew chapter 2, that an angel of the Lord came and it appeared to Joseph in a dream again and said, get up and you got to get out of here. The child, take the child and take his mother and escape to Egypt Stay here until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he did. He got up and he, he moved everything, displaced his family, and, and went in order to keep them safe. When he learned of Herod looking for Jesus, they fled to Egypt. Now, I was looking this up, but, but first off, he left his business, he left his livelihood, and he took his family far from home. And, and last night, I was like, I wonder how far it is from Nazareth to Egypt, Right? I, I, wanted to, I wanted to get an idea of how far they actually traveled to escape Herod's wrath of this man seeking to kill children. And I looked it up and it, I forget the actual number, but it translated um, from kilometers, it showed kilometers first and I go, I don't understand that. And so I, I said, how many miles is this many kilometers? 487 miles from Nazareth to Egypt. Do you know what is exactly 487 miles away from Omaha? Denver, Colorado. I thought that was kind of cool, right? That's like traveling from Omaha to Denver in the, in the middle of the night, get up, grab everything you have, take your wife, take your child, and head to Denver without a car, not on an airplane, but by foot. Pack everything you have and go somewhere different. And he had. And, and if you ever traveled, anybody ever traveled with a young child? 487 miles feels like 3,000, right? Like it never goes in, in the amount of time or in, in, this, in, in the way that Google Maps says it's supposed to. You have to stop from bathroom breaks and, and extra food and dirty diapers and all kinds of other stuff. I can't imagine what that would be like to just have to do that in a split second. And maybe the biggest of all, Joseph chose to raise Jesus as his own. See, Joseph is mentioned and he's present later when Jesus is found teaching in the temple when he's 12 years old. And later on when, when Jesus is back in his own town and, and he's being mocked and, and, and disregarded for his preaching, people even recognize him as the son of Joseph the carpenter. And what we learn from that is that that. Joseph invested and spent time developing and growing, being a dad to Jesus. And then, just like the dad who spends hours coaching his kid in football, only to have him say, I love you, Mom, after, being, after catching the game-winning touchdown in the national championship, Mary gets all the credit, right? Right? That's not the point of Joseph. 
A couple weeks ago, Pastor Craig shared with us an interesting observation that everything we'd learn about Joseph are the things that he did. The Bible never records Joseph saying a single word. It simply tells us his role throughout the story. And none of this could have been easy for him. It couldn't have been easy for him to, to do all the things that, that he was asked to do. It wasn't convenient. It wasn't expected. It certainly didn't go the way that he had thought or planned out that his life would be. But Joseph's choice to obey God, it completely changed his life. And for him, it wasn't about getting the credit. Last week, Leandra talked about humility, and I, and I think that that's kind of the man that God needed Joseph to be. It's kind of the man that God wanted to raise his son. Without ever speaking a word in the recorded story of Jesus' life, Joseph makes a huge statement. Because through his humility, Joseph chose to serve his family. And through his service, he demonstrated love. I don't think love is demonstrated through words. I think love is often and almost always showed through our actions. Quite a few years ago, I was sitting in this blue plaid lazy boy in the family room at my mom and dad's house. I think I was probably home for Christmas or, or some other time. I, I don't remember if I was in college or if I had, was living in Oklahoma at the time. But I, I remember somehow I, my attention got turned away from the TV and, and I found myself staring at all the books on my mom and dad's bookshelves. Most of those books were books that their small group had gone through. And so I started pulling them off and kind of looking through them, and I got to one of them, and I think it was called What Color Is Your Parachute or something like that. Um, and I don't remember who wrote it, but I remember when I opened it up, a piece of paper fell out, and it was my dad's handwriting. And, and, and I've, I don't know that it was a letter to me, but my dad wrote that he remembered being in college, and he remembered that, that he had enjoyed his life, he did what he wanted to do, he got to uh, when he wanted to do it, and, and he mentioned that you know, when he got married and, and all of a sudden, like, you know, he had to provide in the household, that he, he came to this bitter understanding that, that he was, there was something bigger than just doing his own thing, but that mostly... Because he could, he could do what he wanted, and, and when he wanted, he could do, do those things. And he says, and then I became a dad. I became a father. And he said for the first time in his life, he realized that his life wasn't about himself. That something or someone fully depended on him to survive. My dad gave up things while I was growing up. He reminded me once how he mostly gave up golf in order to be able to coach my baseball team and my sister's softball teams. And he gave up opportunities to, to earn bigger paychecks to be with and to spend time with my sister and I. I remember him wrestling with and ultimately turning down, a I don't know if it was a promotion or, a, or a, just an opportunity for a raise. That raise, that job would have, would have moved, helped him move up in his company, and, but it would have meant spending significant time away from my sister and I. And he ultimately said, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to miss my, he didn't want to miss my sister's last couple of years of high school while she was playing volleyball and everything that went along with that. And he didn't want to miss as I was in college and transitioning away from home. I can't imagine some of the choices that my dad had, that they were always easy. I know that often money in our household was tight growing up. I know that, that for a few years there was almost no income as, as my dad was transitioning between different jobs. And he could have easily justified longer hours and, and side jobs or, or transferring or moving our family to a different city or a different town in order to get a bigger paycheck or for more opportunities. But he took all those times and, and he spent it doing things with my sister and I and you know, my dad tells me all the time that he loves me. But the reason that I know he loves me is because beyond his words, he shows me. Looking back over the years, I can see so many times where he made sacrifices and chose relationships and, and served his family as an act of loving us and loving God. See, words are easy. Actions can be hard. And at Christmas, it's easy for the selfish in us to take over, 
to want us to make to to cause us to want to step away from all the things that we perceive to be those white elephants in our lives the inconveniences the the unwanted things the painful things the difficult things and sometimes the misunderstood things we have days off from school or time off from work and it's easy to say i just want to sit on the couch and do nothing and then we realize we've got to travel and spend time with family where all we want to do is veg out in front of the TV or, or just hang out in the comfort of our home. Instead, we, we have to go host family or we go travel and we stay in a house with aunts and uncles and cousins. And, and, and it's not convenient, right? It's not convenient to travel hundreds of miles and pack into houses with all the in-laws uh, for a few days. It's not comfortable to be around people that you don't always see eye to eye with. It's easy to instead declare and follow our own wants and desires, and to make Christmas, along with so many other things, about ourselves. But God's example in Joseph's story tells us something different. You see, love moves us from the selfish to the selfless, and we do that by engaging in service to others. Love is demonstrated when we put the selfish aside and, and we exchange it for the selfless. And this happens often so much more effectively in the context of the relationships that we have. It's shown in the actions that we carry out with the ones that we love. Joseph took all the little white elephants that he was given, a, a pregnant fiance, having to flee, having to travel just, just for a census with a pregnant wife, having to figure out his life. And he made the best of those things. Joseph demonstrated love even when he could have walked away, when he could have avoided the mess. And for Joseph, love meant being present and giving his whole life. And I guess that makes sense, right? God asked Joseph to show love in the middle of the mess, in the tough times, in the confusion, in the things that he didn't see that he needed or wanted. And he asked God to invest by showing love to his son, to be present in his life. But I don't think he just asks Joseph to do that. I think he asks us to do it as well. And I think it's a good idea because God didn't ask Joseph to do something that he wasn't willing to do. God became present in our lives you see, Christmas is a reminder that Jesus is the greatest white elephant gift ever. When Jesus came into the world, most of the world was looking for something different. The Messiah that they had been promised wasn't a baby in a manger. He was, they, they thought that they were looking for a new king, someone who would overthrow an empire that was taking over their lives. Nobody cared that there was a baby born in a manger somewhere in Bethlehem to a scandalized teenage girl and a carpenter for a dad. Nobody guessed that this would be the Messiah, not, not the people that were expecting him. A baby in a manger was anything but what the Jewish people had expected. And nothing about Jesus' life was all that convenient either. Being born in a manger away from home wasn't convenient. Growing up on the run from, from a tyrant had to be difficult. Being persecuted, mocked, and dying on a cross was a huge sacrifice. Those aren't the things that most of us expect. You see, Jesus wasn't what God's people expected the Messiah to be. But he was exactly what they needed. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God asks us to serve and to sacrifice and to, to be selfless because he was also. And this is what Emmanuel means, right? God with us. Gave, God sent his only Son. He gave us his Son. He sent himself to live amongst us present in our lives. God came to be with us so that we could forever be with him. And I think that leads us to our final white elephant gift, right? 
been opening presents every week, and this week is no different. Oh, like sands through the hourglass. These are the days. <laughs> I won't finish that quote. Right? An hourglass. I think this is an hour-long hourglass, so this is about how much time I have left for the sermon. Uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, Pastor Craig mentioned how one of the hardest things for us to part with is money, that, 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 that that's a, an indicator sometimes of our relationship with God and that money is one of the biggest things that can get in the way of our relationship with God. I think a very close second is time. After our money, I think I hold on to time more closely than anything else. The difference between time and money is that it's the one thing that doesn't care about anything else. Time, money might be different for you and I. Your salary might be more, you might be less. The amount of extra money that you have might be, might be different than, than mine or yours or the person sitting next to you. The time doesn't discriminate. For you, a minute passes the same as it does for me. An hour takes just as long. Time is the same for every single person. And yet so often, like sand, we let time slip through our fingers. The days go by, they turn into weeks, they turn into months, and they turn into years. And, and before we know it, everything is different. The kids are moved out, our parents got older, we missed really important things because we were doing other kind of, kind of important things. Last week, Chick-fil-A came out with this, uh, or maybe a couple weeks ago, came out with this amazing little commercial. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, and, um, but it's called The Time Shop. And, and, and when I first saw it, you don't even know that it has anything to do with any chicken restaurant or, or anything like that. But this video is kind of this reminder, and it starts off with this little girl sitting in a room, and she's looking out at the snow, and dad's on the phone, mom's on the computer, Brothers playing video games, and she, and she wants to just go outside and build a snowman. And, and, and they're all too busy. And she walks out of the living room and starts to head up the stairs, and, and she's sad and she's disappointed, and something catches her eye. The, the door of the grandfather clock opens. And so she goes over and she looks, and there's two cats, tick and talk, and they somehow encourage her in a Narnia kind of way to enter into the clock. So she walks back in there and she finds herself in this magical little world and, approach and, and in front of the time shop. And she goes inside and she sees snow globes and different things. And one of the things is, is the, the, the time shopkeeper recognizes her and invites her in. And, and, he, and he tells her, she's like, what is this place? He says, well, it's a time shop. And there's a, there's a clock that's kind of wandering around like it has no idea what's going on. And, and he says, that's lost time. And he points to another one that's fluttering through the air. And he says, that's, that's time that flies. He says, but she starts staring at this globe. And he goes, this is the time that you want the most, right? Time with others. And so she's like, how do I get that? And he gives her this little card. And, and she goes running out and... And she goes and finds her family. She starts telling about this magical world. And all of a sudden, they, they start to pay attention. And she hands them this card. And she says, I want to give you the best gift of all. And she says, that's time. And, and, and in the midst of that, the next thing you see is the whole family outside, making a snowman, hanging out together, being a family. And it pans back in, and, and it's the card that says, I'm giving you the gift of one hour to make a snowman as a family. For me, the video is a reminder. Time is a gift. It's a way that we love and serve our family. But it's not the kind of gift that we keep for ourselves. It's, it's the kind that we give away by being there with and for the people that we love. At times, time can be inconvenient. At times, right now, doing this may not make sense. And at times it can be a sacrifice. But when we serve others, when we love others, 
what we realize is that the time that we share with them is absolutely worth it. To me, the white elephant parties, they're not really about the gifts that we give. They're about the time that we spend with the people that we love and that we care about. They're opportunities to build and to strengthen relationships, to laugh together, to, to engage one another and to act selflessly. They're about the opportunity to serve others and to show them love through our presence in their lives. The Chick-fil-A commercial ends with an invitation, a link. Um, I'm going to show it to you guys. It's, it's, uh, it's chickfilacom slash timeshop. I, I show that to you because it was a commercial that pushed me to make a decision to do something. I, I, don't, I realize I don't oftentimes get to spend the time that I want, and when my kids come and they ask me to do stuff, they, they, they sometimes get, well, not now, or, or we'll do it later. And, and, and that commercial s- spawned me to, to want to do something. And the, the invitation at that link, you can scroll down, and you can say, I want to send a time card to somebody, something like that. And what you can do is you can give others the gift of time. Chick-fil-A has been tracking how many hours and days that people have given. You can give somebody two hours to make cookies together. You can give somebody six days in a row of trying to make it through Star Wars movies so that you can go see the next one. So I made time cards for my son, my daughter, and my wife. They don't have them yet. I was hoping they'd be here by now. I wanted to actually give them to them next service. Um, They're not here yet, but they're coming. My kids are going to know that they get me for a day. And my wife gets me for a day. They get to pick. They get to choose. The time that I have and that I can give is the best way that I can think of to serve the people that I love. So I'd like to ask you, just like Joseph, he gave his life. He gave of his time. He gave of everything that wasn't expected of him, but he did it anyway. How how, and who do you need to demonstrate love to? And what does that look like for you? Despite any inconvenience, despite any perception of importance, or despite the difficulty of even making it happen, How will you set aside the time and give of yourself to serve others and to show them God's love this Christmas? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a God who stepped away from everything to be present with us. We thank you that you give us examples like Joseph, a man who would give of himself, who would take a gift that he didn't really recognize as something that was awesome, that that maybe seemed more of an inconvenience, and that you would set him up to be one of the greatest examples of, of selflessness, of service, and of love, so that we today could know and experience your love and show it to others. So God, help us. Help us this Christmas season, this year, in every aspect of our lives to recognize and to see and to show others the love that you give to help them to know that it was you who came first that gave of your time so that we could know and have the salvation that you promised. Thank you for being God with us so that we can be with others and show them your love. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. This time I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more song together. So if you are able, please stand and join us.